Hey everyone, it's Time Spiraled. Welcome back to MSCM, the October patch notes. We're going to go quickly through quite a few order of businesses here. We're going to check out the bans, check out the changes, check out last month's Grand Prix and kind of talk a little bit about what happened there and in League. You've probably seen the uh, results of that here in our videos over the last couple of weeks. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what you can expect in the month of October and beyond. So for those of you just checking out the format for the first time, this is MSCM. It's Magic Set Editor Modern. It's an entirely custom magic format. It's run by uh, a really great group of curators and council members who take care of balancing the format. And all the sets are designed by people like you, people who love magic, who love creating magic, and just want to get the opportunity to play with their cards. So without further ado... Let's get started on the cards that got hit. And the first one we need to talk about here is Green Elemental Circle. So Green Elemental Circle, also known as GEC or GEC, started the month of September off strong here in League uh, with the release of Toll Midnight. A lot of people were trying it out with the Evoke Elementals, and it kind of looked like it was going to be a big deck here in the Grand Prix. It ultimately ended up with two decks in the top eight, I believe, but they didn't manage to hit the finals. Nevertheless, Green Elemental Circle is banned as of this month. The card just does so much for a one mana enchantment. It functions as a mana dork. In fact, it can function as a double mana dork and even more depending on some turns. And also it just keeps drawing you cards. So whether or not you were hyper ramping up to these five mana cards or just using the evoke modes on some of these five mana cards to get like your card draw off, especially multiple card draws off. If you had multiple of these in play, uh, the card just generated so much advantage. We couldn't let it in the format at one mana. We weren't able to unfortunately contact the developer odds about here. Um, a particular thing about a set like over the horizon is quite a few of these cards on uh, in the set, since it's a Horizon set, were actually pulled from other sets. And obviously, the designers of Over the Horizon have to go and reach out to the designers of these particular cards. Uh, so they handle it, and we just weren't able to get a change lined up this month. So in the interim, Green Elemental Circle is now banned. Uh, I would imagine that an increase in mana value might just be enough in the future. Uh, the card design by itself is quite interesting, and I quite like it. Uh, just not at one mana. So it's kind of funny because this is like a card that's been around for a while. It's been around since like, you know, 2022. And we're here at the tail end of 2024, but it just never really had the right build. Well, guess what? When your five mana spells cost one or two mana, that's where the green elemental circle starts getting a little wild. Our uh, second little card here to hit this, uh, to, you know, get the ban hammer this month is Plaxolotl Piari, who you might've seen in quite a few of our Phoenix videos. Um... This one's a bit of an extra special case. Obviously, its designer, Canterbury Egg, is on the council, uh, but this was a late vote, and the decision to change it happened quite late in the month, and Egg wasn't able to find a text box that they liked. They didn't want to do multiple changes to the card. So for now, it's almost like a suspension. The card is banned as of this month, but you can definitely expect the card to get a rework, hopefully in the coming months, and you know come back to the format a little more balanced. I don't think I need to really explain why this card was so great. If you've watched any of the Phoenix videos, you'll already have seen it. Uh, yeah, this might read three mana, but essentially you're casting a spell for blue, you're casting a spell for exactly red, and then you cast this thing for free, it's a 2-3, and then when you cast your instance and sorcery spells, um, with mana value one for the first time each turn, it copies it, and that's a great way of either filling your bin with a ton of cards, with cards like Against the Waves, or even doubling up on any of your draw twos, discard twos, and it's just amazing at finishing off your opponent with a uh, burn spell to the face like Unseizing Flames. So... Uh, with that said, I'm sure it comes as no surprise that the big deck that was really good this month was Phoenixes, riding on the coattails of this uh, Mioga Firebird, Firebird here. Let's get out the regular render. So Mioga Firebird might be very similar to a Canon Phoenix. Funnily enough, this one comes first. Uh, it's very similar to the Arclight Phoenix. And yeah, it plays fantastic. Uh... There's a lot you can do with this little bird, and we were able to get multiple copies on the board on turns two, turns three, and it just was a really hard to beat deck, Phoenix. It could attack from multiple angles, and I went into it a lot over this month. So it's seen uh, a lot of play in Grand Prix. In fact, 
It won the Grand Prix, a little more on that in a bit, and it demolished League in a sense. Uh, there were numerous lists in the League deck lists uh, by the end of the month. So it's no surprise that Council went and looked at some of the cards in it, and we have been very careful to not do what's called sort of a, you know, we didn't pulverize the deck, but we definitely went after the cards that were egregious, and we're hoping that these changes might be enough that we can keep Phoenix around as a deck. As always, it's very rare that we absolutely gut a deck unless it's absolutely doing things that go against sort of like the format basics. And in this case, it's not the case. This is the kind of deck that can exist and should exist. It's, it's a nice um, combination of lots of things that people love. It feels great to play. Um, and we know that some of the changes that happen might make sort of the uh, Feast Famine effect of the deck a little worse, but in the sense that we think it's now in a much more balanced place, and hopefully uh, these changes will keep the deck alive, but at a more reasonable spot. So Firebird itself got no changes, so it, it hangs around. I just brought it up to kind of showcase why we're going to be talking about some of these next few cards. Our first card here is Against the Waves. Uh, by designer suggestion, uh, this card used uh, to mill a flat base of two, and then afterwards uh, you'd mill equal to the number of against the ways. So you always had yourself a mill two draw card, and then you would shuffle three copies. You conjure them. So that's digital you know, card technology being used here. So you would put extra copies, and eventually your deck would be just full of against the waves, and you're milling more against the waves, and it just kind of went nuts. So now it doesn't have a base mill, so the first one that you play unless you've already put an extra copy in the yard, it's simply going to be a cantrip, and after that, it's going to start milling you. So it, this is a big hit to this card. Uh, it definitely balances it out. So you can expect... I'm, I'm actually wondering, you know, I'm, I'm sure Phoenix probably still wants to run it. It just does a lot of cool stuff, but the lack of early mill is definitely a big hit. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, some players decide to maybe move off of it. Continuing in our Phoenix hits, Creative Salvage, very simple change, used to be an instant, now a sorcery, still a perfectly fine card. Um, I think um, Canon Magic has Magmatic Cash, I believe it's called, or, or Magmatic Insight, it's been a while since I've checked, but it's discard a land, draw two, this is discard a non-land, draw two cards. So, But now it's no longer an instant, uh, which means it no longer works with cards like uh, Mina during your opponent's turn. But also, it uh, will require you to do that at sorcery speed, which will be a, a big difference here for this card. Probably one of the biggest hits is Data Recovery. So this card from Beyond the Black Wall is probably one of the reasons why Phoenix actually was doing so well, I would say. The fact that the old version was X blue, a sorcery, and it allowed you to exile an instant or sorcery card with mana value X or less, and you could cast it, and it would cost two less if that card was put into your graveyard this turn. The fact that you cast the copy meant that it was very easy on turn two to get three spells. You would cast the first version, you'd cast Data Recovery, Data Recovery would recast the spell that you just cast. That's three spells, your Mioga Firebirds are back in, you've probably drawn a lot, so uh, near the tail end of the, the, uh, the month people were playing other types of Phoenixes that came back when you drew, there was one when you cast spells, uh, the whole shebang. This was just doing so much. We talked to the designer, and I think we found uh, a nice place to put it. Now it's an instant, which definitely opens it up to some other stuff, but it's a base of blue-blue. So the way it can essentially be viewed now is if you've instant-speeded uh, cast, I don't know, uh, something with mana value 3, well now for 2 mana you can get that out of the yard because the cost reduction goes up to 3. So you can kind of view it as a 2 mana copy spell, but slightly more flexible in that you can pull it out of the graveyard at end of turn. And of course you can always just pay X blue blue instance, you can pay 3 mana, get a something that costs 1 out of the bin at instant speed. I think this puts it in a lot more fair bucket, I would say, and I'm happy that we were able to find an appropriate change for a data recovery. What else do we got here? We've got a big change to Daydream. Now, this wasn't necessarily um, a Phoenix card, I think, during the Grand Prix, but uh, by the end of the month, people had started uh, finding uh, different ways of playing the deck that essentially involved, you know, absolutely bidding your hand and it would combine with small luxuries. Well, both of those cards have seen change. So Daydream used to be a red sorcery that was discard your hand, draw two cards, quite a strong effect. And then you would conjure a Fatigue on top of your deck, which you can still read here. It's just a colorless sorcery that costs two with draw a card. 
Well, now it's one and a red. It gives an instant or sorcery card in your graveyard flashback until end of turn, and the flashback cost is equal to its mana cost reduced by two. What's really interesting is if you know you have fatigues, it means you can free cast a fatigue at least. So cool, you can draw a card. But uh, yeah, it's just one and a red. Something gains flashback, and it costs less than two. So you can kind of see it as a sort of like Snapcaster ish. Doesn't give you a body but it does reduce it by two. You'll never get that last pip off unless it's a generic spell, which are obviously quite rare, but I think Daydream's in a nicer place, and its designer, Hersey, uh, I think was quite happy with the change. Uh, I believe it now works still very nicely in Arcanum Academia, the set, So, which is always important when we do changes. It's important that we communicate with the designers and make sure that we don't you know, mess up someone's limited by accident. So. Uh, next uh, is a sort of a contentious change, I won't lie. This is Mina Jeweled Minnow. So Mina used to have Flash, and now it has Slipstream. Um, as a member of Council, I will mention that, in my opinion, the bigger issue is definitely not the Flash part. After watching a lot of matches, it was very rare that the Flash was the most relevant part. It was easily the, you can cast the first spell that's an enchantment instant or sorcery with mana value one you cast each turn without paying its mana cost that's that's really the big part of it and the fact that that part is still around even if you can't flash it in means that you can still turn one play out amina and if you pass the turn and your opponent you know starts and you're holding up a one mana counter spell you can do a lot of damage you can't use it with some of our best one mana counter spells like cosmic sinkhole but you can use it with soul and spell pierce respectively and any other instant speed i'm imagining you know you can run some stuff like void flare or um out of body experience there's probably things you can do with this card still i wouldn't be surprised if mina gets hit again in the future um slipstream here was just trying to knock a few percentage points off like we said our point wasn't to entirely eliminate the phoenix deck uh but I got a feeling that maybe Mina was kicked, as we say, a little bit down the path, down the road, so to speak. Uh, there is probably a chance that Mina gets looked at again in the future, but for now, this is how it is. This is how we voted, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in running the card, do check it out. Do show us that does it need another change, or has the lack of flash uh, done enough? Let's look into small luxuries here. Uh, once it loads, let's grab the uh, original printing here. So small luxuries used to be slightly different. Um, it used to have a different sort of ability, but it, it's kind of the same here. It used to just be you draw a card, lose a life, and then when it's put into your graveyard from your hand or library, you put it into your hand from your graveyard at the beginning of the next end step, and it was like a recursion trigger. Now it's actually a little different. It's you draw a card, lose a life, and it exiles itself. But it has, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may return small luxuries from your graveyard to your hand. The biggest change here is that because this isn't at the beginning of the next end step, you can't two-cycle small luxuries with cards that can draw and discard. Cards like Anthes' Accomplice. Now you have to kind of just hope that it makes its way into your graveyard back at your upkeep. So... There's a you may, so you don't have to worry too much about missed triggers and stuff like that, even if it isn't a big issue, and maybe you want to just keep it in the yard anyway, I guess. But yeah, so you'll always get them back at your upkeep, which makes it a lot cleaner. Players don't have to like awkwardly leave it on the field or remember. It's just beginning of your upkeep, you get to go into your graveyard, you can pull all your copies of small luxuries back out. But of course, if you've cast it, it'll exile itself. So uh, yeah. Maybe the card will still see play. People are still going to probably try it out for some stuff. But it's a, it's a cool, it's a clever little design. And it does some neat things with a lot of cards in the format. So keep an eye on small luxuries. Uh, Test of Forsaking almost doesn't feel worth uh, mentioning. But it used to be... I think it's just a small wording, right? Uh, it says, if the trial was failed, you may instead discard two cards if you do draw two cards. Um... I wonder what the original change was. Unfortunately, I'm not able to actually check. Um, I, I'm thinking it was just a um, a wording that was changed. Uh, this is almost trivial and not worth mentioning. But it's, you know, discard a card, draw a card, trial was failed. You may instead discard two, draw two. I guess someone was trying it in Phoenix or something like that. Um, I don't know. I'd have to actually check. I'm, I'm surprised that the uh, patch note here isn't on this one. But... Um, I will have to go check that in the future. I believe it's just kind of like either a wording. You know what? Like, I got two seconds. Let's let's give it a quick little check. Uh, test of Forsaken. Let's see what we say. Um, looks like nothing there. Interesting. 
I I know the card came up like once, so yeah, it's a clarity change. Okay, it's what I thought. There we go. Okay, cool. Super, that's what I thought. It's just a wording clarity change to make it very clear about what happens. Cool. Uh, not worth digging deeper into this card for now. So we're going to go back to our uh, little little patch notes. And the next one's a, a bigger change than, than this one. It's Thought Paradigm. Now, Thought Paradigm featured primarily in one of our mill videos. But uh, yeah, this card could do a lot when it was one mana. It conjures a data point into your hand, which is essentially like a clue. And just whenever you cast a sorcery spell, a player would mill three cards. So you were either able to play sort of like an aggro mill deck and absolutely dumpster your opponent's deck into the yard. This adds three on every sorcery, and most of the mill cards were sorceries. Uh, now it's two mana. So as I said, we're being very careful with one mana engines that just do a lot. So Thought Paradigm kind of uh, gets sniped into that bucket here. And uh, it still does a lot, but now it does it at a much more uh, fair. Honestly, I don't mind it too much at two. It just means you can go turn one blank pages, turn two thought paradigm. And it's kind of a lot slower than obviously what you used to be able to do, but I think that's what this card needed. All right, another big change, Vile Progenitor. So this was my little baby here until midnight. Um, I completely overshot this card and I overlooked the fact of how annoying it was to get rid of. Sorry about that, just a little coughing fit, had to mute the mic. Uh, this was a 3-4, and when it entered, you'd make a 3-2, and whenever land entered, you'd make a 3-2, and when it attacked, it gave things trample. Overshot, that's my bad. I'm glad that it had a month in the sun. Now we put it at somewhere a lot safer. I got a feeling it's going to be a lot easier to deal with. It still has the same, when it enters, you get a 3-2. So by itself for five mana, you get 6-4 in stats. And if you ever manage to get it to five lands, and I know that kind of seems funny to have a card that costs five with a five or more land rider, but because of the evoke, because of other ways there are to cheat it in or ramp it out, and of course the set that it's in is a micro cube inspired set, uh, five lands is relevant, then it buffs your board, horrors you control get plus one plus one, and then they get trample, including itself. So it becomes a 4-3, your other 3-2s become 4-3, so it's all nice and thematic, and the evoke is still one and a green, you get a 3-2, and it's a five mana card. So the card's a lot more fair, and I'm very happy with this change, not only for the format, but also for Told Midnight's Limited. I think that'll make a big difference. Uh, next, what do we got? We got Whisper Woods. Uh, so villainy deck, you know, loves this card, loves Whisper Woods. Uh, it was black and a green. It was mill three cards. When you do return a card from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, yeah. So now it's another non-land card from your graveyard to your hand. So you can't just loop a single copy of it. Uh, which again, didn't ever really end up doing something. Often you were picking something else up with Whisper Woods, but now that it's another, it just kind of like nips that in the bud. It was an unintended designer change. So now you need two copies to kind of loop Whisper Woods. It's a little more fair. Not that it'll make a huge difference. Um, what else? Not worth going into too much of the rest. We had some name changes. Goblin Chariot is now Goblin War Chariot because guess what? Goblin Chariot is an existing canon card name. Uh, Flooded Depths I can at least bring up and I'll show you why. So we used to have a card called, well, we do still have a card called Flooded Morass, which is a sort of a typed um, check land here. And we used to have a card called Flooded Depths, which is now called Floodwater Depths. Uh, and this is a fetch land. So the problem was you would have Flooded Depths and Flooded Morass, and it was kind of confusing which was which. Now with Floodwater, you at least have um, a little bit of a a difference and the same thing happened here this one was a little more contentious but again i felt very strongly about this we have a dual land called shifting glade which is a type pain land we call these the plague lands and then i had a cycle of lands in worlds away called the shifting land cycles well people would often almost accidentally put shifting glade into their decks as well but now they're called shiftscape so it's something like shiftscape crag so just little change not huge, but it does mean that now we're not accidentally finding the shifting as the sixth honorary member of this cycle, and we're not accidentally confusing our fetch lands and, you know, our, our land that we want to search. Whew. That's kind of like the big changes. And the reason some of these are pretty big is, guess what? There's a chance Phoenix is still doing fine. Mina is probably still doing fine. And some of the decks being played in League right now are still using some of these cards, which is good. Because sometimes in a format... Um, it can be easy to say, wow, they hit the card, I don't think it's playable anymore, and then it doesn't see play. But, you know, often they're probably still playable, not saying that they always are. 
but I'm sure a lot of these cards will survive. So we're going to take a quick peek over here um, at the Grand Prix. I just want to go over the top eight decks, kind of give uh, just a shout out to some of these. Some of these haven't been nerfed. So if you're hopping into Grand Prix Incheon this month, uh, GPI, and you don't really know what to play, guess what? Some of these decks are still totally viable, and they went all the way up to quarters and semis. So without further ado, let's check out our uh, top X, so to speak. So we had Splash Cat over here. Uh, I absolutely love the name. You may be entitled to financial compensation. So I believe this was one of our, I just gotta make sure Mastery is here. Yep, so this was Heart Attack. So Heart Attack in this case was, I believe, Sultai, so green, blue, and black. And it primarily focuses on landing a Mastery of the Veil to deal lethal damage off of a huge amount of mana produced by Heart of Zadina. The rest of the deck is control removal counter spells you've got your ramp pieces lump, uh, lumped into there intrepid and gate of realms not only search lands but also can function as like a payoff for doing so lots of cool stuff and simul is just great with the fact that one of its plus ones is just untapped permanence which can let heart jump up to a crazy amount of mana which brings me to another topic Heart of Zadina is really on a lot of people's watch lists it is a land that can generate a huge amount of mana uh, it's a lot easier to just, you know, rack up a lot of lands in a sense that it's harder to disrupt than, say, you know, cards like getting a bunch of Devotion or some other stuff. So Heart of Dezina is being looked at. Uh, it's not changing this month. It's not being emergency banned. We might discuss it for the future month, but it is a feature of the format, this land. We feel that it opens up some decks that don't really exist in canon magic. And there are ways of getting rid of it. In fact, it's kind of funny. Lotus Barons is right there next to Heart of Zedina. Uh, you've also got some other cards in the format. Um, you have cards like Mirror Gate. Uh, if I just scroll down somewhere, my gosh, where is it? Here it is. Mirror Gate. Okay, let's get the original printing so you can see what it looks like, which can change up a land and get rid of stuff. It's probably not good, and I don't really recommend you use it, but we do actually have Ghost Quarter now in the format. Uh, Lotus Barons, like I mentioned, is a way of getting rid of lands. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of cards that uh, you can use. I'm a big fan, personally, of cards like Time Worn Crags, which, you know, costs one less for each non-basic land you don't control, and then it kills a non-basic land, and it's tapped. Like, it just does a lot and they don't get anything back so there's ways of getting rid of it um but it does do a lot and i understand the gripe that i was killed out of nowhere but what's happening is you're being killed out of nowhere past turn four it's on turn five turn six and i can understand that it might make it feel like the uh, earlier turns didn't matter but this deck has to play pretty control to allow itself to get up to there and sometimes if you're able to put enough pressure you can take out this deck and in fact this deck did not win so splash got taken out here by joel's mono red devotion this is just big red beats you've got your big uh cards like emissary rapacious rattler oros but then you know just a lot of the aggro staples and burn pieces and this deck took it 2-0 i didn't have a chance to i believe watch this match so maybe splash cat stumbled a little bit but you know this this deck didn't make it uh ultimately uh moving down here we're just going to check anganer here uh one of our frequent uh league players was also on phoenixes but uh, this copy of phoenix unfortunately got taken out by zangi so that brings us to our top eight. Let's go through each of these decks once, and then we'll talk a little bit about how these matches went. Uh, a few of them are on the channel, so you know you can always go check those out. Pipsqueak was on Phoenix. So Mina, Mioga, Plaxolotl. The, obviously, the deck's going to be different now that this is banned. This is slightly changed. Zerat still around. You're probably off of Spirit Script, I believe, at this point. Data recovery's changed, against the waves has changed, but you still have Unceasing, you still have Wheat from Chaff, Gift of the Phoenix, Unquenched Greed. Salvage is a little weaker now, but probably still playable, and we haven't touched anything here in the lands or in the sideboard. So there's still a lot of pieces of Phoenix that are still around, and honestly, you can just see it here that uh, that damn Pipsqueak and the Phoenix deck essentially took the win. But like, big shout out to Pipsqueak because she wasn't going to be playing in the Grand Prix, and like hours before went like, all right, I'm net decking this Phoenix deck. Let's see how I do, and she just absolutely demolished. These are like two O's, two O's, two O's here. Uh, in the finals and there was a few two ones I think on the way here but not many so you know big congratulations on piloting that deck well and playing some great matches 
Uh, Joel's here was the Devotion deck, made it all the way to the quarters, but unfortunately lost to the Phoenix deck, which is kind of a similar build, you know, does a lot of damage, does it fast, but Phoenix has just did so much more, so much quicker. Uh, Ducky here was on Black Red Sinful Tempter. We've got videos of that on the channel too. Using cards like Reckless Mutationist, you can haste out cards like Emissary, Neon Claw, Halford, uh, Fleeting, Sinful Tempter, or Terrors, and you just do a lot of value and a lot of damage early. You back it up with removal, with some burn, some haste granting, and Chigao to recast those creatures out of the graveyard. So this went all the way up here to quarters, but lost to Ricky Rister's blue-green beans deck. So the beans deck was one of our two green elemental circles. So, pardon me. This green elemental circle deck was green-blue. And uh, it used less of, like, the cheating out the cards. I mean, it could with, like, an Orichi, but it used a lot more, like, value pieces. So you had your cards like Performer, Ramsey, Prodigious Pania, and you were, you know, generating huge amounts of board presence, and then you were just absolutely clobbering your opponent. This deck did really well. And aside from hitting Green Elemental Circle, and obviously Vile is just a little more reasonable now, the rest of the pieces are still around. Um... I do agree that the Vial change does hit the deck quite a bit, as does Green Elemental Circle. Like, that really was the reason to be doing all this, because of the amount of card draw you were doing. So just switching to another Mana Dork might not do enough. But it was nice to have this deck have a chance to uh, play it out for one month. Uh, Ren over here was on our other deck, I believe, that was the Heart Attack. Yep, here's Mastery of the Veil, and there's Heart of Zadina. There's a few different pieces here, so we don't see a Temeration in the instant slot compared to uh, um, Splash's list, I believe, but Temeration was not great this month. Phoenixes are three mana, and everything else was five mana, so Temeration didn't see a lot of play. Maybe it'll pick up in the next coming months. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, Toast here was on the green-white version of Green Elemental Circle, which used flicker spells like Glory of the Star, Across the Planet Void, on repeat, to recoup all that amazing value you got off of Green Elemental Circle, Vial, and all that jazz. So, uh, And it ran pieces like Mana, Aesthetic, and Runebound Disciple instead of uh, some of the enchantment-based ramps, but it lets you, you know, Captured Pale Tusk was a cool find. Uh, if you flicker this thing, you were up three planes and a bunch of light. It just did a lot. So, unfortunately, this one lost to uh, our uh, our heart attack deck here. And uh, then our last two matches, we have Zangi, who was on ninjas. Obviously, Zangi is kind of like our ninja, I would say, you know, uh, ninja's greatest fan. It leverages a card called Monument to the Fallen Man, which puts creatures with mana value 2, exactly 2, from your hand onto the battlefield. And it just loads it up with great... Uh, either recurring or uh, cards that can, you know, get other cards back out of the graveyard, cards that can tutor, cards that can just, you know, absolutely kill you out of nowhere. Now that Herald of Oblivion costs two instead of one, that was a September change. So this deck actually did pretty decently, but unfortunately Cyber uh, Cyber's Villainy deck was just a little too strong. Um, dirty work done cheap, so it's Villainy, Dead Man's Party. Uh, you just have a ton of of black based non-creatures and you just leverage the fact that villainy will kill your opponent and their entire board if you let them get set up you pack it with some hand attack you pack it with cool cards like salome exunt endeavor pith wilt you control the board and then you get one two and more villainy cards out and uh, that's all they wrote so we had these decks move up here and eventually we got to a final where phoenixes went 2-0 uh, against our second heart attack. You can go and watch that match uh, on the channel. In fact, I believe that'll be the one that I put as the uh, little video at the end of the thumbnail, so you can all check that out. It was a really nice match. I believe game two was a rough hand for gateways. I think I think things, either we got stuck at too few lands, I think. Uh, I'd have to go check it back. But the first game was really nice, and it really showcased why Phoenix was so good. So... Uh, with that, that'll bring us a little bit to uh, what we've been seeing in League. So, League is interesting because in Grand Prix, you're able to see your opponent's deck list. In League, not so much. But when there's a deck that does really well, people tend to try bringing it through League because, well, you kind of want to get those League points if you're going for some of our uh, some of our rewards. We have promo cards that players can earn, and in fact, I'm going to show, show you one in just a second here um, over on Instigator. But a lot of other decks were tried in League, so we have a channel on the Discord called Decklists, and you can always see the decks that were played during a month. So we had 
I believe a few things tried. Uh, we've had some burn decks. We had beans, as we said, was being tried out. Ricky went 5-0 with it uh, before the Grand Prix started, or just about... Uh, yeah, a few days before the Grand Prix started, a green elemental scam, the green-white version also performed well in early league, so I'm not surprised that that was there. Uh, a Storm deck actually did quite well, 4-1, um, and it looks like we didn't hit any of its cards, I believe, so Storm exists as a 4-1, so there's definitely a chance that... Uh, you could uh, run that deck back. Uh, another Beans went 5-0. So yeah, Beans kind of started as like the big scary card, the green elemental circle decks. And I, I kind of think it's a shame we called it Beans decks because obviously it's not Beans. And if we just called it Gek, it would have been a lot clearer on the deck list. But if you see Beans, it's talking about green elemental circle type nonsense. Uh, and then like right on the day where uh, the Grand Prix was about to start at 8.53 p.m., Phoenix 5 0 in League. And uh, I believe that's the list that that damn Pipsqueak picked up and went the whole nine yards with all the way to finals. Uh, we had another one also get a 4 1, I believe, at 10 01. So that's like right as League, uh, right as the Grand Prix launched, another Phoenix did really well. So that kind of like led the path for what the month of September was going to look like. Uh, more Phoenix decks uh, were played. Lots of players picked it up. I mean, if you can earn the league points, there's no reason not to. Uh, we had a Mardu Clearings deck, so that uses a card like Condor Clearings here. Uh, we have a cycle of these. I, I don't know what people call them. They're the bird enchantments. They're always two mana. They're always two colors. It's always when you do a trigger, you get a some form of 1-1 one, one flyer. And then there's always a trigger that whenever something happens, you get a value. So the original one was not Condor Clearings. I'll just give you a quick history lesson. I believe our original one was Parrot Pools. Uh, it looks very pretty now with a little frame. This is whenever you cast a multicolored spell, you got a 1-1 one, one blue with flying in haste. And when three or more creatures dealt combat damage to a player, you would draw a card. Uh, Condor Clearings gives you a flying vigilance. And when three or more creatures you control deal combat damage, they have to sack a creature. And if they can't, they discard a card. So this has been the one that sees a lot of play. Uh, whenever you cast enchantment spells, works with additional copies of Condor Clearings and just like quite a few really cool enchantments in the format, like Butterfly Rebellion. So that was a 4 1 here in League. Uh, Purple went 5 0 with a really nice mono black mid range list. And that's just really cool to see because for a while people have been like, oh, mid range, we're not seeing mid range anymore. Well, guess what? 1 5 0 last month and in League. And I remind you that League is different than Grand Prix because the decks that you will face either is a very known quantity if you pay attention to what people are running, or you'll be fighting a lot of like just unique decks, people trying stuff out. Uh, and it's not as competitive as the GP. It doesn't make it any less difficult, but it just makes it for a different environment. But hey, Mono Black Midrange did really well here, and I don't believe it got hit in the slightest. Um, Robocong picked up a heart attack win with a 4-1 later down in the month, around mid-month, which is really nice. A blue-red prowess deck did quite nice here. Uh, looking really quickly, it doesn't look like it was using any of the cards that got hit, which is really nice. It's cool to see a Mindstorm's Eye back in the list here. Uh, scrolling down, what else have we got? Some more net decked Phoenix. Uh, somebody was running a sort of like Nykthos build, which is really interesting. So using a card like the Orange Orchard. So um, this is another kind of land that can add a lot of mana and it adds it for each token you control or permanent you control with one or more counters. So the uh, token mode lets you use, and I believe I showed these earlier, the shiftscape lands that create, uh, they sacrifice themselves to create a basic land, uh, sort of like, uh, it's not a basic land, it's a basic land typed token. And if you get enough of these, well, this land generates a lot of mana, especially if you can have, you know, a lots of other tokens, uh, which you definitely do with cards like Posey of the Seal Cloak, Simul also makes tokens and untaps lands. You got your Root Corruption, uh, yeah, so this car, you know, this deck went 4-1, did really well. Chumbeck piloted a 4-1 Spirit, uh, sorry, not Spirit, Clerics deck. You know, you got your classics like Dark Sand Acolyte here, which just drains your opponent for a bunch of life. Kind of hard to track because you always have to count the number of times you gain life this turn, but this card is an absolute house. Uh, Black Red Tempter, Ricky piloted a version of it to 4-1, which is really nice. More Phoenix. Not surprising. And here we hit the unearths at the tail end of the month. So this is kind of where people were at the beginning here of October, looking at cards like Deadwood Terror, um, 
which are is a 2-2 death touch zombie. When it enters from a graveyard, you get two tokens that are copies of it. It kind of puts on a, you know, go wide vile progenitor kind of feeling to it. But, you know, three 2-2 death touchers is not nothing. And there's just a lot of ways of getting the value out of it. However, small luxuries was slightly changed, as we said. So that won't be um, seeing play here. I don't believe this one was on Daydream, so that's definitely not an issue there. But it did get one small hit. Whether or not the small luxuries hit is relevant enough means that a lot of this deck is still absolutely totally playable and it did get 5-0 amethyst did really well with that deck um we had the mill deck but as we said the mill deck thought paradigm was hit which going to two mana probably does enough and funnily enough um it has a transformative sideboard where it's all phoenixes that comes in which i always found pretty funny uh more phoenixes wow we just really loaded up on phoenix more unearth uh and finally we get to this month we have our first deck here in the list we have ricky piloted neon claw burn to a 4-1 so let's talk about neon claw knight because some people have been definitely talking about it on the discord neon claw knight is a 3-1 for two that when it enters or attacks you get a function enchantment token and either you get can't be countered costs red less to cast or if the spell would deal damage to a permanent or player it deals an extra point of damage the this spell costs red less the cast is the one that people are worried about the fact that you can go turn two neon claw knight you get the reduction mode and you can immediately launch a card that either gives haste something like uh i believe it's bite blitz the name of the card plus two plus zero and haste and then you get another version and then if you're able to pick up uh, a burn spell afterwards you just do a lot to your opponent so yeah maybe this is the kind of card that we want to be looking at this month some sort of like low aggressive it's not phoenixes doesn't go to the yard and it's true that uh neon claw knight does die to a lot more things being an artifact means you know if you're bringing in metal munch it's got one toughness you can hit quite a few things you can immediately go for it but Oof, what a card. I'm not surprised that people are bringing it up as something to keep their eye on, and I definitely would keep my eye on it, both in the leagues and maybe for a change uh, in the future. All right, what do we got left? We're going to check out a little bit of the promos. Uh, we sort of did this last month, but we didn't do it correctly, so we're just going to make sure that we do it all right. Uh, every month... Whoever wins the Grand Prix earns the gold promos. So you can go all the way back to the first one, by the way, here. Master of Tranquility was earned in, like, you know, 2017 as the very first winner of Grand Prix, which was Grand Prix Alexandria. Our, our first three GPs were all named after cards that could have been in a Magic set, which is why you've got Alexandria, Baghdad, and Cairo. Um, but after that, we always kept with regular cities. So we had... Um, Edmonton, we have Fort Lauderdale, Geneva, and they've always gone in alphabetical order. So if we go to the very, very, very last one, you can see that uh, we have our winner with the new Unceasing Flames art here. Uh, it was designed by Pipsqueak and it was won by Pipsqueak, which I think just feels really great when you can design a card and you can take it the whole nine yards. So Unceasing Flames, uh, let's just pull up the regular one just so you can read it a little better. It deals X damage to any target where X is two plus the number of cards named Unceasing Flames in your graveyard. And then you conjure three into your main library. So one more hits the gold uh, promo list. Big thank you and a big congratulations to Pip for playing last month and for doing so well with it. We're also going to check out our secret layers. Um, I believe it's important to showcase the work that people make, whether it's releasing a set or doing something else. And uh, we had some secret layers released recently. I just scroll down, they should be here. So one, two, I just gonna make sure that we see all the ones. So what we're gonna do here is we're actually just gonna pop up the actual layer number, which should be one, four, five. And we're gonna switch to view them as images. So uh, I believe this is the frame from Murders at Karlov. Um, six nicely picked cards here. It's Will of the Council. Uh, Silver sent these in. So we've got Break Free, Keeper of Secret Havens, Mia, Into the Unknown, Pestilent Scavenger, Lost Titan, and Warden of Time. And someone will absolutely correct me if I'm wrong. I believe these are VTuber arts. Uh, but they look pretty nice. I know not everyone's a fan of the frame, but I think it looks kind of neat on some of these. And uh, especially the Mia, Into the Unknown. Uh, I like personally the original art, but like this one's actually not so bad. And uh, if you want to run it in Commander, I know somebody is. Uh, yeah, it's there for the pickings. After that, we've got Lair, I believe was 145. So this is kind of an interesting Lair. I know it looks like there's duplicates. It's just because it counts front faces, back faces. Um, 
I forget what the actual command to remove that, so don't worry too much about it. Um, this card is currently glitched. It's supposed to, I believe, show something different, so don't mind it too much. But this was a lair built from a secret surprise that was made for a secret Santa, I believe, for one of the users in the format, where two decks were built, and the user had to fight against uh, the opponent's deck, which would talk to them through the, the flavor text and stuff. So some really nice eclectic pieces of arts. I will say that my absolute favorites is Valdez. Uh, I really like our little raccoon, this little friendo. Um, and it was just so hard to find another raccoon rogue. Would you believe it? But thankfully, secret layers have been able to kind of like shore that up. So we've had like previous iterations, like the YouTuber version. We've had a sketch art done actually by one of the users in the format styles. Uh, we had this nice one, but honestly, I think we finally hit a Valdez alternate art that I would prioritize playing over the uh, the regular one, which is, you know, it's it's rare because I'm usually a stickler for uh, for the cleanest arts. I really do like uh, Miss Margaret Barton. I do like the front and the back face. I think this is absolutely gorgeous with the white blue. I mean, the, not that the original isn't bad. The original actually is super classic. He's a really good card. But um, I really like how pretty this one is. And it's funny because we had, you know, another recent version was was earned recently. So if you're a Honkai Star Rail fan, um, there's also this version. And then we had this version. So, you know, we've had a lot of cool um, Barton arts, which is good because this card is an absolute house. And you'll be seeing it a lot. I'm, what I like is, you know, we had Shinrei, Suzume, Barton, uh, a lot of cards at sea play Valdez. So, and obviously Wayfarer Shrine, just adding on to the absolute absurd amount of shrines that we have. So, you know, a big shout out um, for this lovely little lair. I think it was a great design. So yeah, that kind of wraps up the promos that kind of wraps up last month. So let's talk a little bit about this month. Uh, League has been, has started. Players are playing. As I said, we already mentioned the deck list that, uh, did 4-1. People are talking about Unearth. People are still talking about Phoenix. Is it still going to be good? Uh, we're kind of up in the air right now, so definitely keep an eye on the League videos over the next couple of days. We have until the 7th before the next Grand Prix starts, and then we'll be able to just kind of follow through on what the new meta will be. I have a feeling we'll have a few less players, and this is just because tech, the trend has usually been to have a slightly higher amount of players at the start of a season when a new set comes out because they love playing with the new cards. But usually the month after we hit a few things, maybe a few people drop out, but hopefully a few more people come in. It's October. Could be a good month. Uh, previous Octobers have been you know, pretty decent. GP Warsaw had 34. So I'm definitely going to be encouraging, you know, players to jump in. We're already at four and we have plenty of days left. So if you're really on the fence, you don't know if you want to play MSCM, it's actually pretty easy to get into. Um, we have lots of resources for you and you can bet that, uh, I'll do everything that I can to put out content and to help you on the discord for those of you that want to like jump in and, uh, get your feet into the format. Um, we have new players that have said that they've had a great time. I'm not going to name names. I don't want to put them on the spot. It would be a little, little awkward for them without having earned, you know, previous permission, but we have new players that have said they've really enjoyed the onboarding. They've enjoyed how friendly and welcoming the community is. And they've enjoyed having like access to such a free format to just brew and try a bunch of different things. So if this is your jam, come on over and try it out. We'll be super happy to have you. So with that said, um, that's kind of like the wrap up for this video. Uh, hopefully, you know, it went a little longer than I hoped. I was thinking a 10 minute, look at us, 40 something minutes, but there was a lot to say. And I think some of it was important. Um, so do keep an eye on the format. We're constantly putting out content for y'all of you. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you uh, come play out some MSEM. So take care and have a good one.